Hey there, thanks for joining us today on our live stream for our worship here at the Adairsville Church of Christ. Uh, whether you're joining us on our Facebook page or on YouTube or out in the parking lot via our FM transmitter, we are thankful that you have gathered for worship today. You know, this is a great blessing that we have to gather to worship. And one of the ways that we are authorized to worship in the New Testament is through singing. And so let's join in together with a song as we begin. Uh, this will also give us an opportunity to gather our emblems for the Lord's Supper because we'll partake of communion before we get into our lesson. Uh, our first song this morning is I Need Thee Every Hour. If you have a songbook and you want to join in, that is number 288 in our songbooks. Number 288, I Need Thee Every Hour. Let's join in together. Well, I hope you have prepared your emblems for the communion. Uh, we have a tremendous responsibility, but it's also a great pleasure for us to come together on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper, to remember the Lord's death until He comes again. We usually do that by, we usually start out by joining in with a song to better help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Today uh, we will sing, Low in the Grave He Lay, that is number 408 in our songbooks, number 408, Low in the Grave He Lay. Let's join in together.
I would direct your mind this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. As you probably know, the Apostle Paul was uh, busy writing to the church at Corinth to straighten out a number of doctrinal problems they had. And one of the things was that they had begun to misuse or misinterpret the Lord's Supper. And so he writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse number 15, and he writes this, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. You know, the Apostle Paul is trying to tell the brethren here at Corinth that they should realize that they are all part of God's family. And instead of having divisions and strife among them as they came together to partake of the Lord's Supper, they were supposed to be treating one another like family. After all, we are the family of God. And we, when we assemble around the Lord's table, we demonstrate the unity that we have as part of the body of Christ. Because no matter where we are in the world or what's going on around us, on the first day of the week, God's people partake of these emblems, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, to keep the Lord's death, to show the Lord's death until He comes again. This is a time to let all the worldly concerns and problems out of our minds and focus upon the Lord and upon His will for our lives. Let's do that at this time by first of all offering up a prayer for the unleavened bread. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we are thankful unto Thee for this Lord's Day that You've blessed us with. Father, we're thankful for every opportunity that we have to assemble around the table of Thy Son. Father, for those that are doing it in church buildings today, we are thankful. For those that are doing it uh, gathered with their family, we are thankful for those as well. And Father, we are grateful for this unleavened bread and what it represents to us, how it represents the broken body of our Lord that was sacrificed for us on the cross of Calvary. And Father, we pray that as we partake of it at this time, we would do so in a way that would be well-pleasing unto Thee. Help us focus upon Thee and do this in a way that uh, uh, would be pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful unto Thee for this fruit of the vine, which to us represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us on the cross of Calvary. Father, we're so thankful for the power of that blood and what it makes possible in our lives, even the forgiveness of our sins, the fact that we can be washed in that blood and made part of Thy family. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice. We're thankful, Father, not that just that he died, but also that he rose from the grave to give us the hope of the resurrection one day. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we pray that we would do so in a way that would be well-pleasing unto thee, and that would you continue to look down upon us and bless us as we strive to serve thee. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, this concludes the Lord's Supper, but another part of our worship is to lay by in store upon the first day of the week as God has prospered us. We might not be doing that right this moment, but hopefully we will do so before the day is out. So let's offer a prayer at this time for the contribution. 
Heavenly Father, we realize that many things in our society right now are in a turmoil. Father, we realize that some have lost their jobs and others have not been able to work for a while in their normal way. Father, we are thankful, though, that Thou hast blessed us with life. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to provide for ourselves and our families, even in times of difficulty. Father, we are thankful to be part of Thy family, and we realize the great responsibility that we have to take care of one another. And Father, we know that Thy Word teaches us that one way we can do that is to lay by and store upon the first day of the week as we've been prospered. Father, as we give back unto Thee at this time, we pray that we will do so cheerfully, not gr grudgingly, nor of necessity. We pray, Father, that we will give generously, realizing that the more we lay by, that the more good that we can do. Father, we also pray for our elders and those who choose how these monies will be spent. We pray, Father, that they will make the right choices that will be effective in the spreading of thy gospel throughout this community and throughout the world. And Father, we are thankful again for the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us in this life. We are grateful unto thee, and it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, join in one more song together. Uh, oh, How I Love Jesus, that is number 473 in our song books. If you'd like to join in, 473 in our song books. And we'll sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Well, as we begin our lesson, uh, I think one of the dangers as we have been uh, separated from one another for uh, a long period of time now, I think over a month we've not been able to come together and worship. And I think one of the dangers is that we drift away from God's Word. You know, one of the things that makes us distinctive from many of uh, these man-made religions out there in the world is that the religion comes from God centers upon His Word. And the more we appreciate and love the Bible, the more we as Christians are connected to the Word of God, then the more like God's people we will be, the more faithful we will be, the more mature we'll be, and the more we'll be pleasing in the sight of God. The closer we are to the Word of God, the bigger impact we will have on the people around us as well, in our communities, our neighbors, even our own families. And so I wonder if you have been staying in the Word as we've been separated from one another. You know, we have a lot of uh, opportunities to study with uh, these devotionals that are posted on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we have the access to more gospel preaching now probably than at any other time in the history of the world. You can go on Facebook or YouTube and, and find sound gospel preaching that will lift you up, that will make you stronger in the faith. The only question is, are we taking advantage of these things or not? Uh, I pray that we will listen closely to this lesson this morning and we will allow ourselves to be drawn closer to the Word of God, that we will make ourselves better Bible students as we think about that which is written. Let's talk about a few of these things. Number one, that which is written in God's Word is, as we stated, the very Word of God. Those inspired writers, the apostles and other men who wrote down the Word of God, they claimed nothing less 
than, the, than that they were inspired of God. And so what they preached and what they wrote down for us, they expected to be treated as the Word of God. You know, the Bible says, for instance, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, that no prophecy of the Scripture is given by any private interpretation. For the Scripture came in uh, time past uh, by holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so no, no one of these Bible writers just decided to sit around and say, hey, I've got a good idea. I think I'll write it down and, uh, and send it to people to read. No, these men were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were inspired of God. That's why the Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration there means God breathed. And so... God breathed out His Word. And so we need to treat the Word of God uh, as it came from God. Uh, you know, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 13, the Apostle Paul talks about those who received the Word that he was preaching as it was the Word of God and not the Word of men. And so we need to have that same attitude too and understand that that which is written is actually the Word of God. And so today, if you want to hear God, if you want to let Him speak to you, then you need to be studying His Word. You need to read the Bible. Number two, that which is written is also eternal. Unlike the things that are written by men, the Word of God will never go out of date. It will never become... Uh, it will never become worthless. It will never become vain because the Bible says that it is eternal. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And so then, because the word of God is eternal, it never loses its value. Have you ever thought about the idea of value with how long a thing lasts? You know, the things that are eternal, even though they are invisible sometimes, are the most precious things that we have. You know, the, this physical body that we have is only temporary, but the soul that resides inside of it is eternal, and the soul is more valuable than all the world. And so, even though 2,000 years have passed since uh, God had, the wor had His Word written down, they are still just as precious today. His words are still just as precious today as the day they were written. And so we need to recognize then the inherent value of the Word of God, among other things, because it is eternal. You know, the Bible says that uh, the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so if we want our lives to be based upon something that lasts, if we want our, uh, our souls to be treasured uh, by God, they are treasured by God. If we want to treasure our souls the way we should, then we need to base our lives upon that which is written, that which will last forever and ever. And so that which is written is eternal. Number three, that which is written is also the truth. You know, there are a lot of fake things in our world today. There's a lot of bad information. There's a lot of uh, what our president calls fake news. And it's true. There is a lot of false information out there. That's really always been the case. You know, Jesus called the devil a liar and the father of liars. He's been lying to man since, uh, since Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and the serpent appeared there and tempted Adam and Eve to sin. He did that, by the way, with false information. And so there's always going to be falsehood out there. But Jesus told his... Uh, he prayed to, uh, to the Father about his disciples in John 17, 17 and said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know... In today's society where so much is false, we ought to treasure that which is true. And God's Word certainly is the truth. It's just as true today as the time 
that God gave it to us. In John chapter 18 and verse number 37, Jesus said that his job was to come and testify of the truth. And everything that Jesus preached was the truth. He didn't ever preach anything that was wrong. And so Jesus preached the truth. Um, the Lord wants us to have the truth. I know that because he told the apostles in John chapter 16 and verse number 13 that the spirit of truth would come and guide them into all truth. Now the reason the apostles need to be guided into all truth was because they were going to be writing it down for us. And so God wanted us to have the truth. And so he sent the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, to the apostles and other inspired people so they could write it down so that we could have the things that God wants us to have. Uh, if we want to base our lives on the truth, then we need to base our lives on that which is written in the Word of God. Next in line, we need to understand that that which is written is also expected to be obeyed. You know, the gospel is not just facts to be believed. We do have to believe the gospel, but it's also commands to be obeyed. The Bible tells us, for instance, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, that the Lord one day is going to be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. And so the question is, have you obeyed the gospel? Jesus said that only those who do the will of God are, on a, are going to be able to get into heaven one day. Matthew 7 and verse number 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And so if we want to get to heaven one day when this life is over and the judgment is past, we have to obey the gospel and do the things that God says to do. You know, when we obey the gospel, then God is in a position to bless us. Uh, he's never blessed the wicked in, in the same sense that he has his people. I understand that sometimes that the wicked get to breathe the air and see the sunshine and uh, live in houses and drive around in cars. But the spiritual blessings that come from God only come to them that obey his word. Those who, uh, those who are in Christ Jesus according to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. And so God expects His Word to be obeyed. They're not just suggestions. They're not just instructions. They are commandments to be obeyed. And so we need to do what God says to do. You know, there were some people who sort of were taking the Apostle Paul's preaching as suggestions. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse number 37, he said, No. Uh, if, you th uh, if you are prophet or spiritual, then you need to acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And so the things that Paul wrote, the things that all the inspired, inspired writers wrote and preached were commandments of God. And when God gives a command, He expects that command to be obeyed. And so the things that are written in His Word are things that must be obeyed. And then finally, that which is written in the Word of God is able to save us. You know, the most important reason for studying God's Word and then putting God's Word into practice in our lives is so that we can be saved one day. Our salvation, the very salvation of our souls, depend on it. This is why in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16, when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he said that the gospel, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so Paul knew that the gospel was God's saving power. He knew that he was writing it down so that they could read it and put it into practice, not just... Uh, you know, to, to increase their spiritual knowledge or to make them better people, but ultimately it was so that they could be saved. You know, when uh, the angel appeared to Cornelius in Acts chapter 11, 
Cornelius was told to go and send for Peter, a man who had the message of the gospel. Why? So that he and his household could be saved. The Word of God has the power to save men today as well. And we need to do what the Bible says to do. You know, when Paul was writing to the young preacher Timothy, uh, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse number 6, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. Listen to what Paul writes here to this, uh, to this young preacher, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. He says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And so he wanted them, uh, he wanted him to continue to study and learn and preach the Word of God. Listen to verse number 16. He says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The gospel is God's power to save. Paul told Timothy, You keep the doctrine. You keep the teachings of Christ, and in so doing, you'll save yourself and those that hear you. That's a great challenge for every gospel preacher. You know, first and foremost, I'm responsible to myself. I want to go to heaven. And I know that in order to do that, I've got to obey the gospel and keep it faithfully myself. And, and then I can work on my family, then I can work on my neighbors, then I can preach to the people in the pews or the people watching on Facebook or YouTube. I have a responsibility to obey the gospel myself so that I can be saved. What about you? Do you want to be saved today? Do you want to obey the gospel so that you can be saved? Then you've got to heed and obey that which is written in God's Word. The plan of salvation is not difficult to understand. As a matter of fact, you really need help to miss it. Sadly, a lot of people have had that kind of help in this world. The Bible says that in order to be saved, you've got to hear the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. You've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 3, 16. Many in the religious world will stop right there and say, once you believe, that's all you have to do. But that's never what the Bible says. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, that you must believe enough to repent of your sins. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, If you don't repent, you'll perish. Well, we don't want to perish. Nobody should want to perish in their sins. And so we must be willing to repent. Once, we're, once we repent of our sins, then we can make the confession before men that we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's what the Ethiopian eunuch was told to do in Matthew chapter, uh, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he was taken and baptized. Unless you're willing to make that confession, you can't be saved. Nobody can be saved who's ashamed of Jesus. When you make that confession, then just like that Ethiopian eunuch, you can be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. You might say to yourself, if you've never heard this plan, of salvation before, why do I need to be baptized in water? Well, the simple answer is, you need to be baptized in water because Jesus said so. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Also, when Peter stood up with the apostles on the day of Pentecost, he said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so... Jesus taught baptism. Peter taught baptism along with the other apostles on the day of Pentecost. And we teach baptism today, not because it's just some kind of symbolism or some kind of outward show of an inward change, but because it is a command that must be obeyed. Now listen, that doesn't mean that I think that there's some kind of magic water in the baptistry or wherever a person is baptized. The power is not in the water. The power is in our obedience to the commandments of God. But unless you're willing to obey God and do what He says, then God's not going to save you. That's not how it works. You've got to do God's will in order to be saved. Once you 
obey the gospel through being baptized, then the Bible says that your sins will be washed away, Revelation 1 and verse number 5. That you'll be added to the church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And you'll begin your Christian walk. If you've done all that and realize that maybe you've drifted away from God, maybe you allowed sin to come back into your life, you need to repent and pray that God will forgive you, and He will. And if we can pray with you and for you, let me tell you what you can do in these unique circumstances. Call your elders and talk to them. The shepherds here at this congregation will be happy to talk to any one of you. Uh, they will be happy to pray with you and for you. We can announce that to the congregation if you wanted to announce. Whatever needs to be done to put you back in a right relationship with God, it is worth it. And so obey the gospel if you need to. Repent and pray that God will forgive you if you need to. Or let the elders know if you need prayers publicly and we'd be happy to do anything that we can. Before we uh, dismiss, let's have another word of prayer. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Thy Word, the Bible. We're thankful for all, for, for all of these precious things that we've talked about here today that can be found in that which is written. Father, we pray that we will continue to be faithful unto Thee and do the things that Thou would have us to do, to be good students of Thy Word and apply those things that we learn there to our lives so that we can be the kind of people that would have us to be. Father, keep us safe throughout these times of difficulty. Uh, we realize that uh, a lot of people are sick and the virus is, uh, is still in a spreading phase, especially here in, uh, in, our, in our county and in our state. And we pray, Father, that if it will be thy will, that these things will be behind us quickly and we'll be, be able to be back to our normal lives as soon as possible, if it be thy will. But, Father, we also will that all things that would be done would be thy will and not our wills. Father, keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you for tuning in, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or, uh, or here locally. We're thankful that you have worshipped God today, and we'll see you next time.